Good afternoon. Um, this is just really a rapid introduction to the subject. It's a, um, an attempt to contextualise the discussion that we hope to have, to put into context the following papers, really, that we've gathered together, and uh, to summarise the situation as we see it from the UK. One of the, one of the um, positive things I think it's, it may be positive, may not be. One of the things that I've noticed, anyway, uh, speaking at other conferences, EAA and other conferences around Europe and elsewhere in the world, in fact, is that whatever problems we have in the UK, whatever discussions we're having, everybody else is having them too. We're not, none of you are alone. If you think that, if you think you have an issue, don't worry. We're all going through the same thing. And that's why this is a good forum for this sort of discussion. So, I'm going to talk really just very quickly about three projects that we've done in England, or is it four projects in England, that, um, that put into perspective the issue of archive storage, the future of archives, and um, the discussions that we're having about how we can manage archaeological archives in the future. I haven't put up the usual slide which defines what I mean by archaeological archives, but you can find the definition in the EAC guidelines, volume one. How many of you know about the EAC guidelines? I should have put the URL up. Um, you can find it on the web uh, if you look up the European Archaeological Concilium. Um, but essentially, it defines an archaeological archive as the product of an archaeological project that has been selected for long-term curation. So on that basis, uh, Historic England have funded the Society for Museum Archaeology to conduct three consecutive annual surveys of museum collecting in England to find out how many museums have archaeology collections how many of them are still collecting archaeological archives to add to those collections, and how many of them uh, are going to be doing that in the future. So the idea <coughs> is to see if the numbers over three consecutive years would change. And we can see that in 2016, um, 154 museums curate archaeological archives. Of those, 119 are still collecting. Further 60, so 35 have stopped. Further 61 reckon that they will run out of space in their collection stores within the next five years. So that's by 2021 now. Uh, and a further 16 in under 10 years. So by 2027, 112 museums out of 154 will have no space left to collect archaeological material from archaeological projects, but worse than that, they may have to stop collecting because they will not have um, the opportunity to create more space. So if that's the, the situation, um, and this was a, a survey conducted in 2012, in 2012 there were an estimated 9,000 uh, archaeological archives from separate individual projects that, had, that could not be deposited because the museums that would normally collect that material had stopped collecting. So that was uh, six years ago. Uh, you could probably double that number now. That's uh, what we've been calling for some years a crisis. Um, and as somebody pointed out, if it's a crisis, why hasn't it got worse? Yeah. What's, is it still a crisis or has it got beyond crisis? Well, some museums are still collecting, but there is still uh, a serious issue. So, people have suggested that there are two, uh, beyond actually creating new stores, which is something that museums cannot have to find the resources to do currently, um, there are two suggested approaches to addressing this issue. One is for museums to um, create space in their stores by rationalising their collections, by retrospectively applying current standards of collecting to, uh, to older archives. So where projects in the 70s and the 80s collected material such as stone or uh, in 
industrial waste that may now be less likely to be collected, they could go back and reduce the space by reducing the quantity of those materials in their stores. And then looking ahead to apply a more rigorous selection strategy to projects in the future so that when museums were offered archaeological material, they could be certain that it, was, that it merited long-term curation. So being more selective about what is being collected. And that's really the subject of this session. So, um, very soon, in probably the next four weeks, the Society for Museum Archaeology in the UK, who were commissioned by Historic England um, to bring together guidance on rationalisation, will produce their, their document, which is based on five scoping studies carried out by five separate museums in England, um, who looked at how they would set about rationalising their archaeology collections and creating space by, um, by reducing the quantity of material. Uh, and this is the sort of, um, this is the sort of uh, structure of the guidance. The idea is that those scoping studies would feed into guidance for other museums to follow if they, um, if they wanted to carry out rationalisation. The results of those five scoping studies, the overwhelming result is that rationalisation is not worth the resources you would have to put into it. The level of recording that would need to be carried out on material in archaeology stores is so high that it's lab and labour intensive that no museum could currently afford it and it's highly likely that no funding agency would give them the money to do that. One of the museums Suffolk County Council in the east of England worked out, they graded the, their, um, their collections by those in red that are good candidates for disposal to those that are medium candidates. They calculated that, by, that in order to create a maximum of 2,892 box spaces in their store, um, for the resources required to do that, they could build a new store three times bigger than the one they've already got. So, so for them, there was no point in carrying out the rationalisation exercise. But this is good news because it means that when people go to a museum and say, why don't you throw away some of the stuff you've already got and make space for some more, they can use these case studies to answer that question. And all the museums agreed that, um, that actually carrying out the project um, helped them to know more about their collections and give them an opportunity to promote them further and make them more accessible and bring more people in to use them, which would help to, um, to, 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 to answer the issue of how, of why we're, why we're actually bothering to store all this stuff. The, select, the, the, third pro, the second project, the third project, I suppose, after the survey and the rationalisation, is the Selection Toolkit. Historic England have funded the Archaeological Archives Special Interest Group of the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists in the UK to put together a toolkit to enable people, to, which people can use to set out and develop a selection strategy as part of an archaeological project. Um, and the template that accompanies that toolkit is designed to lead people through the course of a project, from project planning to archive deposition, um, and take them through the selection process and what issues need to be resolved at what point of the project by which members of the project team. So there is no doubt about what people should be doing when. And, it, and selection is not something that you do at the end. That's the point. You begin with a broad selection strategy that is structured around the aims of the project, and then you review it as the project progresses, as you recover material from the ground, as you uh, complete your surveys, as you answer the aims of the project, those aims might change. And so your selection strategy should. And it's formulated in, uh, around the contents of, of an archaeological archive the digital components, 
documentary components and the material components, the finds, uh, and shows people how they might lay out uh, a, an approach to determining for individual types of finds how you should, how you should go about selection. The final project I just want to quickly talk about is a review of the standard of reporting on archaeological artefacts in England. I did talk about this last year at EMEA, but uh, some of you might remember. Um, this basically developed criteria for um, establishing what a good finds report should contain. Um, it conducted a survey of grey literature, so digitally available site reports and finds reports in, in project reports and it reported on uh, the general findings of, um, of, what, of how many of those reports actually met the criteria. So the criteria, the, 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 the criteria were intended to, uh, to sort of score the quality of finds reports and it's based on um, the premise that a finds report should characterise the objects in question, to quantify them, to allow analysis and, comparis and comparative analysis, and it should interpret those results in relation to other finds and to the project and the site. Uh, and those are some of the questions. There are 40 criteria. Um, and these are the results. So none of the reports met 100% of the criteria. Well, we wouldn't really expect that. But um, 43 of them, 43% met less than uh, met less than 75% of the criteria, um, and 38% met less than 50%. That's not that's not good. Uh, in fact, in some of them met, met less than 25%. Um, the question then is, um, uh, and these are some of the comments, <coughs> object dimensions are not consistently included. If you have an assemblage of pins, you'd expect their dimensions to be presented. Uh, Quantification is not, not always standardised. Um, there are many, many problems with it and you can look it up yourself if you follow that URL. Um, only seven of those reports included any scientific analysis uh, and, that <laughs> uh, and, uh, and although that's not always applicable it sort of indicates really that certainly in commercial archaeology the use of scientific techniques is underrepresented in terms of finds research. Um, so the question from that really is, um, if we're going to be more selective about what we retain in archaeological archives, how can we do that securely if we don't know what it is we're not keeping? If the standard of analysis and reporting is not good enough, then we don't have a basis from which to develop selection strategies or protocols. So how do we improve our standards and how do we encourage people properly to record their material and to prepare archives in a way that enables selection to take place? Where do specialists fit into this process? A lot of specialists I speak to would not um, deselect anything. They'd want to keep every single animal bone or shirt of pottery or fragment of building material. That's not really helpful, uh, but they need to be part of the process. And then, to, for, to address the theme of the conference, can scientific applications help us to be more secure in developing selection processes uh, and in informing uh, the, the process of, um, of formulating and um, uh, transferring archaeological archives, and I'd better stop there. Thank you.